guys again. <laughs> Welcome back. Uh, as we are coming to an end, I hope you are enjoying uh, this conference. Uh, so uh, let's uh, Welcome, Marco, and uh, he's an uh, independent uh, consultant and hype tech. Uh, he helps companies to set up uh, their streamlined processes and to set up development teams. So, Marco, thank you for being here. <laughs> I hope you will enjoy his talk. Thank you for this nice introduction. Welcome, everyone. So, uh, my name is Marco, and today it's, we are going to talk about age of multi-framework frontends. So, if you are not tired with the microservices, micro frontends, now we are talking, adding to the story also multi-framework frontends, which can combine together with monorepos and uh, micro frontends and all the other cool and hype things that are um, right now. Um, hyped in the dev community, right? So um, I'm currently working as independent tech consultant for different uh, projects. Uh, I've worked mostly uh, on, uh, I advocate mostly React, but I'm also taking a look at the other frameworks from time to time and helping optimize the products um, of different companies and standardize the development process when using React, because as we know, like React, it's kind of just a, uh, um, library and to use React properly with the high performance and everything, you need to use a lot of tools from the community. And uh, that use of the community with just React library sometimes known to be confusing. So I'm trying to advocate for the right, right use of the proper framework tools and uh, libraries when setting up the production ready projects. So you can find me online, uh, Martic Dev. It's mostly, and uh, here I left a QR code for you if you want to add me. So uh, let's first know the audience. Uh, thank you for joining here. Let me know uh, if I say frameworks. Does everyone know what this mean? Okay, and <laughs> and when I say uh, when I say uh, Svelte. Okay, and front-end? Do we have back-end developers? Yeah, <laughs> full stack, right? Nice. Okay, and when I say uh, Astro, Vit, okay, nice. So we are around there and um, thank you for answering these questions because I like uh, to know what should, uh, sh uh, what should I explain a bit deeper and what sh uh, should I uh, have the overview. So um, this will be overview of today's lecture with some code examples in the end. We will need, uh, we will just first talk about need for frameworks, then the need for combining frameworks, then multi frontend frameworks. We will take a look at the tools and the ecosystem. And after that, we will see how to cross plat do uh, cross platform state management when we have um, different platforms and different uh, tools in the same project setup. And at the end, of course, we will take a look at the benefits and drawbacks of this approach and uh, if it's good for your use case or not, or it's just a hype thing that you can have, but actually never use in production. Does this make sense? I hope so. So let's first start from the beginning, uh, need from frameworks. So frameworks and libraries are a huge help to developers in designing and devel uh, developing products. So most frameworks and why we use them because they provide some infrastructure that has already been figuring low level details. What does it mean? So in uh, use of frameworks, we don't have to deal with the boring uh, DOM API and do the DOM traversing and stuff like that because we uh, have a framework which it's kind of abstracting that and providing much ni nicer API uh, for doing that things. So this is allowing developers to focus on the specific project details, actually the implementation and the things that client, the client uh, that they're working for, uh, it's actually asking for you if they know what they're asking for. Okay, so frameworks tend to be simple to understand, consistent and easy to implement. And uh, if you find use, using some frameworks, uh, and you see, oh, this is too complicated, and that's how the new frameworks are uh, 
made up. So someone says, oh, this framework is complicated. I will simplify it, and then takes that framework and wrap it another framework, and then that framework wrap it in another framework. And that's how we get the new frameworks and uh, following the hype, right? So uh, idea behind the frameworks and libraries, it's uh, that they use the best practices from the past with the ability to evolve in the future. So uh, when some fra framework is kind of adopted by the community, we assume that it's uh, applying all the best practices from, from the past and the uh, know-how learned from the projects that uh, problems that uh, it was solving. So uh, this actually uh, the key point of the having a framework is the, to allow developers to build the components that are kind of reusable. So reusable parts that are standardized that have a boilerplate that we can reuse and uh, develop our apps in the consistent way and actually uh, lower the uh, the number of lines that we need to. Right, but it's not always that, like that. But developer, in the end, idea of the frameworks and everything is the developer has to write less code. Less code means more rest, right? No, yeah, okay. Okay, so um, since we take a look at the framework, let's see why should we try combining them or what, what would be the use cases for, for combining frameworks. So each framework has kind of strengths uh, and um, if we take that that part each uh, each framework straight and combined in the one app that has uh, all the kind of strengths from the framework we get some flexible application which can uh, take advantage of multiple frameworks but each part of the uh, each framework it's actually solving the problem what it's actually designed for. So we have some frameworks, if we are talking in terms of UI frameworks or UI libraries or whatever, that are kind of really optimized to, to ship less JavaScript code or to do uh, some uh, really nice, they have a really nice uh, implementation in some libraries to doing charts or stuff like that. We can combine that um, frameworks and create one app that is kind of robust and flexible. So uh, our goal uh, of this, for this is actually that we adapt to uh, changing requirements and uh, meet the diverse needs of our users. So flexible ap application allow us to um, take the best part fr from each framework and modular, modular, uh, uh, create models for each independent part and then um, combine uh, and with that enable flexibility of the application. So multi-framework applications can be pow powerful and efficient way to create complex modular software, which should be our goal as engineers. So of course you can achieve this the same same thing with a good architecture and modularity of single framework. But sometimes there is in some framework that some library that maybe you need or uh, the client requires you on some legacy code that you that's written, for example, in Vue, that you should integrate some React charting library or something like that. So you can achieve uh, that with the same framework, but actually uh, in the existing project, there, there is a need to combine the frameworks and do a different things in different frameworks. So let's take a look at tools and the ecosystem that are currently available and that we can take advantage of uh, when using multi-framework uh, multi, multi frontends, right? So um, every now and then new framework emerges and every one of them has a promise to revolutionize the, how we build the web. It's the fastest, it's the simplest, it's the lowest learning curve, it's all integrated, all the things that you can imagine. So all of these are valid points to create a framework. And each uh, framework solves specific use case. So for example, there was rise on React, right? And after that, a lot of a lot of uh, people were kind of complaining of J JSX, JSX syntax and say, oh, this is like terrible. You're writing JavaScript inside HTML and stuff like that. But when you start typing, you just kind of grow into it and see how the description and the debugging it's much easier when you have that modulus components and stuff like that more descriptive in more desc descriptive way than the imperative way. So actually. Uh, 
a lot of frameworks kind of uh, adopted that way in their own way. So for example, in Vue, we have all that kind of templates. In uh, Astro, we have something else. In Svelte, we also have kind of HTML that you can use, but all of them are kind of taking advantage of that, that, that comp the composition of the page in the smaller parts that can be reusable. And then we have a next and the uh, remix that they're solving because React is a library, right? And uh, the React uh, remix and next are solving server-side rendering issues because just using React, you need to set up your own server to to serve from from uh, from the server, right? Uh, and in uh, next and remix, this is kind of by default nowadays in the latest versions. So um, they're wrap, wrapping on that, um, on top of React and moving forward. So why, because Next is doing great thing, but Remix appeared because Next had a problem with routing, right? So now, now, now Next it's uh, fixing the routing, and but we have a Remix and then one big company decided, uh, oh, we need this framework. We don't like the approach. Uh, that's uh, in which next it's going because they are kind of community driven, community driven. But actually, the big company Vercel uh, stands behind them. So, for example, some companies bo bought Remix and they want to build their own uh, for their own use case. And all these use cases are actually solving projects on a large scale. They're they're like really big uh, system e-commerce source and stuff like that. Okay. So that's how React is made. React is made for huge problem that Facebook has with a lot of, a lot of interactions and everything that um, that uh, Facebook UI brings with them. So if you didn't look, you can take a look at the React documentary. It's really good how they build it. So just um, a side note on, on this. So often these days, apps are using one specific UR library uh, and framework, for example, React, Vue, Svelte, that kind of most popular, to define components and build the experience for the users. But this is kind of changing since now we already have few years of legacy code that's out there. And also the change for the developer and main power, it's kind of shifting. So earlier we, we had like kind of uh, a lot Node.js developers that are now moving to the front end, and now we have a front end moving from one framework to another. So um, the industry is actually changing the need for people who can work on the project. So uh, some company who, for example, choose Vue uh, cannot find enough Vue.js developers, and they now <coughs> want to switch for a particular part of the app for the React. So they need to kind of reimagine their architecture and reset up the app so that uh, they can onboard new React developers, but they also don't want to throw away because business does not accept that, that you throw away everything that's written, that's paid, right? So they are trying to reuse as much as possible of their own uh, legacy code and integrate it with a new framework and new models and everything. And if the app is like in the large scale, Actually, it means that already have a set up some, some state management and um, some structure behind it that can uh, that needs to be reused actually in the new model that we are developing, for example. So this is where we, uh, in the last few year, few years, um, get a lot of traction. So it's advertised like next generation front end tooling, which is in my opinion exactly that. It uh, provides like really good uh, uh, CLI for creating new projects, uh, integrating uh, a lot of things for bundling and releasing. So it's much faster than uh, some other tools that are uh, there. And it's actually uh, kind of speed up, uh, pushed up further the development of the, of the frameworks. So with it came Astro, it's, um, all in one web framework designed for speed, but it's much more than that because Astro it's actually a really powerful tool that allows you to customize your own front ends and ship less JavaScript uh, than in uh, standard single page applications. And also uh, provides you the way of optimizing that apps that can work with multiple front ends and existing components that you already have. So you don't, you don't need to create everything from scratch. You can take whatever framework or design system uh, that you 
already have and just integrate it in the new framework if you want to. So, as I said, Astra helps us op optimize our application by ensuring that uh, we are not using more JavaScript than necessary and al also allow us to, uh, to combine different URL libraries into a single project. Using Astro plugin system, which is kind of core of the Astro, we can build and enhance our websites the way we want. That meaning including other frameworks and tools. Together with WIT, Astro, it's a really powerful tool and it provides, by officially provides integration for most of the po today popular frameworks. For example, React, Vue, uh, Svelte, SolidJS, Preact, Lit, uh, AlpineJS, also server-side uh, rendering adapters and other uh, that are listed uh, here. So how is this possible and how Astro did that? So there is something called um, island architecture, which actually, which actually uh, Astro just adopted. They did not think of it, but they adopted it and implemented in that new framework. So the key differentiator between Astro and other frameworks actually relies on its architecture and that's that island architecture. What does it mean? It means that we can have a separate parts of our app living independently and rendering independently of the rest of the page and all the that part actually can be separately hydrated and refreshed and rendered in different uh, ways, right? Make sense? Maybe, maybe not. So Island refers to interactive UI component on the uh, otherwise static page of HTML. What does this mean? It means that like the Island architecture actually encourage that we focus our development skills uh, into small components of like chunks of interactivity within server rendered web pages. The actually the output of that, of that island, it's progress, progressively enhanced HTML, which actually knows um, how the enhancement occurs, uh, actually what's happening on that page, right? So uh, rather than in the single page uh, applications, uh, being controlled the full page rendering where we have like that all the uh, JavaScript should be rendered pulled from the server inside the browser and they're executed Now we have we can have multiple entry points and we can separately re render static uh, HTML uh, and static page and then just uh, Pull up the chunks of different islands on our page. We will, we will see this in the example uh, a bit later so um, so the script for island architecture uh, of that interactivity that we have on the page can be actually delivered and hydrated independently. So allowing that the rest of the page, the things that are not um, using JavaScript, it's just, just actually pre-rendered on the server and just served there, right? even if it's written in some of, of our frameworks. So it's actually pre-rendering everything on the server and serving HTML on the, on the front end. This is the part where Astro says, oh, we are, n we are um, helping you to not ship JavaScript more than you need it, right? So with this island architecture, we can have multiple islands that can exist on the page and, uh, and and also island always renders in isolation, which means that each island can actually use any UI framework or just um, plain HTML or whatever we want. How is this possible? With the help of WIT and the plugin system of um, Astro. What's happening with the state management, you may wonder. So state management, if we are talking of a bit more complex apps that are not just um, simple presentational websites, right? We have all, always have some interactivity and uh, for that we need some to preserve some state, change some state, include and apply some filters and stuff like that. So for the state management, uh, Astro also provides uh, one solution, but the problem is actually how we can share that information between components since 
we can have components that are different in uh, that are implemented differently in different frameworks. So for example, in React, we have a context API, which uses provider consumer pattern. And this pattern actually, as we know, works that we provide something on the provider level and each child that it's actually wrapped within that provider can consume the provided value. In Vue, on the other side, uh, we have something called Reactive API, which is kind of using data binding of the properties specifically that can be rendered in template and based on change on that property, the UI re-renders. So they are kind of following more conventional like action state view, uh, which is kind of similar to Redux if you are a React uh, developer. Okay. On the other hand, Svelte recommends using stores, Svelte stores. They are providing readable, writable, and derived containers for storing data. So we have problems that we, sh we should combine actually all of the that different, different solutions, uh, different um, solutions for the state management into one solution, that we need solution for cross-platform data flow. And as someone yesterday in the lecture mentioned, um, actually, the, your state, the, your stores, are plain JavaScript objects. They are not connected to any frameworks. They are just objects in an array pushed and pulled and uh, read and re written. Okay? So that, that's it. And a, a red, uh, just Redux, it's not a uh, React tool. It's just a pattern with a small library that kind of provides a way how to manage state in simple objects, right? So, as we saw, all of these ways are valid ways for fix fixing the store management, but we need a common solution that works in all UI libraries. And since all the libraries are actually uh, UI libraries, uh, we can have a tiny state management that's uh, platform independent and which is called nano stores. And this nanostore, this is their description, a tiny state management for React, React Native, React, Vue, Svelte, and Vanilla JS. It uses atomic stores and direct manipulation. The nanostores library allow, allows the author to, to store um, that any component, to store, uh, store states that any component can interact with. What does it mean? Uh, it means that they are just implemented as a plain JavaScript and it has a zero dependencies, and it's actually framework, framework, framework agnostic. So let's take a look at the benefit of the bro bro uh, drawbacks of this, this approach. And um, then we will take a look a bit on the code, how this, uh, all of this can be implemented. So what, uh, when we have, um, like frameworks, we are having one size fit uh, solution that have some restrictions. And actually the new frameworks that are emerging, they're actually basing on that restrictions that some particular framework has. You have Angular, for example. Angular is one full flag framework that has everything in it. It has patterns that you need to use. It has uh, all the best practices from the kind of also object-oriented programming. It has a data binding. It has uh, Eric Sting built in. It uses TypeScript, right? But it it's kind of enormous. You sometimes you don't need all that things. That's why React appeared as a UI library. And since it, React went on the other direction, like kind of completely, it's just UI library for creating views. If you want to use it for apps, you need to combine it with other libraries that are provided that are needed to to handle state management and the other things. So the key point is that you can, you can do anything and everything with a single framework. Some may be a good fit for certain application and some don't. Okay. One of the use case that you can kind of uh, use the multi-framework front end, it's actually migration of the legacy code, actually gradually migrating because business, it's not usually uh, accepting that you stop everything and just rewrite everything. So they, there are always new features that need to be implemented. Um, if you use meet, uh, meetup.com, they, uh, they also have a large code base and they are kind of refactoring it in uh, React, the, the most of the part, but actually they are still maintaining some parts like user profile 
and stuff like that that are in kind of different frameworks. So this can be achieved with the different approaches of micro front ends, or maybe it can be achieved also with the multi framework setup uh, in this way. So before we jump to conclusion, let's see how we uh, can use all of these components into one project. I know that all of you like a lot of to, uh, the most, the, the, be the best thing that you like is actually to look at the code. So let's jump into this. So I have here simple project, simple Astro project, and I will explain you how to set up it really quickly. So you can actually run the commands like create, uh, yarn create Astro, and it will uh, offer you like really nice CLI to bootstrap um, Astro project, and you choose whatever, whatever you want from their prompts. And then you get something like this. You that you that get the project with the standard structure, and then um, in the package JSON, right? You can take a look. There is Astro, and there are uh, some other things that are included uh, in the simple project. But actually, I added here a different Astro plugins and integrations for different projects. So, for example, I added Astro for React, Svelte, and Vue. I added Nano Stores for React, Vue. Uh, I added Pico CSS, which is like really small CSS so that my UI, it's not um, falling apart. Uh, also some types and some other dependencies like Axios that I like to, uh, to use when I uh, develop work with, with the API calls. So what we have here, we have a SRC file. In this SRC file, we have components. And if we take a look at the components, all the components are actually in different frameworks. We have counter, we have o uh, overview, and uh, uh, which is counter in React, overview in view, and user filter and user table and Svelte. And if we can take a look at the index, our index page, it's actually uh, Astro page, which is importing all that um, other components like a regular J6 components. Okay, I hope that this looks familiar. Also, we have a layout. Layout, it's a, you know, what's layout? Kind of wrapper around uh, your index HTML that you can uh, set up. And then we have this slot thing, which is saying, okay, this is kind of main component where we have our app uh, loaded, or actually um, our pages uh, are loaded. So what I did here, I just set up the, the basic HTML. Uh, I have body and uh, I have header. Inside header, I have some me menu navigation. It's not important. I have main and footer. So this is the main app. And if I switch to, I switch to somewhere here. Okay, I can see my app running here. I hope it's running. It's running. Okay, so. This is my app and it has a basic structure, if we take a look, that I set up there. So it has header main, header main uh, div and inside main we have like a lot of scripts and we have something called Astro Island. These Astro Islands, it's actually our components that are rendered from our, within our Astro page. And it's actually, as I said there, just enhanced, enhanced the HTML that knows actually how to, to execute and what needs to be done. Okay, so this is what's uh, appearing in this main uh, in place on this slot. So let's take a look what we have here. So why I first first thing I have um, in pages like index page in the, that index page I'm importing all the pages. I'm also fetching data and uh, this is similar to um, new use hook in React if you are following that uh, actually kind of uses a suspense that can actually load your data and handles everything in between so you don't need to await it to, you don't need to await it and um, handle different states um, in in the component but you can just fetch data independently of your JSX. Uh, and in the background, of course, Astro, React, and everyone, it's fetching, uh, uh, it's uh, actually handling that for you. So if I take a look here, let me comment this, okay. So if we take a look here, we have that uh, list, which is actually fetched. This API call is just a regular API call to the to the service, fetching random APIs. We also added, because we are using TypeScript, we added also types. So this is actually that we have um, 
a really good implementation of our API layer and uh, how we can uh, set up the things, um, kind of separate the data fetching from our components. So we create that and just awaiting the, this async call, uh, async call, we are fetching data in our user objects and that our user objects can, don't, can then be passed to our users. Okay, let's take uh, this user table uh, component. So a small disclaimer before, uh, before that. Uh, I'm not a Svelte or Vue developer, I mostly do React, but uh, I'm uh, kind of familiar with the concept. So if you see something, if you know the syntax and you see something that's not, um, does not make sense, please uh, feel free to correct me. So uh, here we are just, uh, this is how the um, Svelte components looks like. We have a, a script on the top and down there we can write like regular um, J6 HTML. And in this HTML, I can use uh, these directives in, uh, in Svelte, which is saying, okay, the thing that you export here, uh, actually it's a property that these components receives and you can use that component inside this down there code that's uh, displaying. So what I'm saying here, uh, for each user as user, which is setting keys for user ID, I'm just creating table row with um, their names and um, company names, right? So this is actually like mapping the components in React. This is exactly the same code in Svelte. So on here, I, I don't have anything, uh, uh, just these users which are fetched, the, the, which are actually passed uh, by props. So let's take a look here. I fetch the users, when the users are ready, they are passed to the props. And if I don't say this client load, this is actually Astro handling on the server and it's everything fast because I'm already getting all the HTML which is already pre-rendered on the server, right? So actually here, I kind of don't need that, this client load thing because this can be static HTML which is fetched on the, on the server. On the other hand, I can have a filters. Okay. I can have filters. Filters need users, maybe not, but uh, okay. User filter. Let's take a look at this components component. It's also Svelte component. It has some uh, drop down of the users and also for each filter, that's actually mapped uh, from the user eye colors. Let me see, eye colors. So I'm mapping all the users, uh, picking up the eye color for all the users and I want to, um, to put it in the drop down so that I can select that uh, as a filter and filter users by eye color, okay? I'm using here set just to have the unique values because this will create um, duplicates in that array. So I'm saying, okay, create a new set and this is actually just picking up the the one that are unique and setting them for the uh, setting up them for the uh, this filters uh, property and then this filter property I each uh, filter through each uh, filter property and uh, create a list item which I which attach uh, on click listener which is looking like uh, this. So this is actually all the filters that are available from this user that I fetched and each of these users I, I'm actually, I can select the colors of their eyes. So if I open the console here, I've, I see that I um, added that to the store. So kind of on each select, I'm actually pushing that to array and uh, adding to the, uh, our nano store that can be reused. So this is also Svelte component, but let's introduce some other component, for example, view. And in view component, let's do something like this. We, we just want to access the selected uh, colors of the eyes and display them in some overview of the, um, on the page. So let's first enable that component here. Okay, overview, we need client load because on each user filter, click select, we need event listener, which will update our store and the, our store will update. So on each update, this overview component needs to re-render so that it can show the new colors. Let's take a look on that. 
Okay, so right now we have this overview component, which is our view component. And if we select green, we see, oh, I have a bug probably here for first selection. Oh no, it's fine. Just the selection is not good. So I have selected green and gray, and I select amber, blue, and so on and so on. So this is actually rendering in the view component passed down from the Svelte component. Okay, makes sense. But actually what I needed to do is a cl say directive client load because this is interactive JavaScript that is not shipped uh, initially and it needs to be loaded on the client. So we need to say, uh, hey Astro, ship this uh, script for these parts if, because they have some interaction and they need to re-render. Okay, let's do the same for the uh, counter. Counter is actually React component, as you can see, and it's actually just counting how many filters it's selected. So let's see that. So we have applied filters here with the count of zero. So let's uh, add some selection, brown, amber, and so on. And then we can add a button to clear them, but I did not add that, it's not uh, the point. And also we can filter that and apply that filters also in the, our user table. Here, what I'm doing actually, let's first investigate this on filters. I'm using this nano store thing and it has a specific syntax that you can take a look at the documentation and actually exporting, creating the store for our, for our component, which is called Atom. And this Atom, it's actually array of strings. So it's empty array in the beginning and these are just selected fit filters. So on each click, on the filter page, I'm actually just updating that store uh, with the updated selection and filtering, uh, selecting that JavaScript object with the set method prototype and saying, say, okay, pass down the, the updated selection in that uh, filters. And this is probably where the bug happens because I console log before I update. So, um, and this is actually maintaining everything in this um, plain JavaScript object, which behind nano stores use kind of also uh, different approaches uh, on how to synchronize data between different frameworks and, um, and everything. So basically this is it. And for example, when using this, I just import nano stores for a specific framework and they have different implementation for each framework. For example, this is use store, maybe in React it's more familiar, also use store hook. And uh, here we mark that with the, this dollar sign and it's then reactive. And then we, on each change of this store, it's actually, this is re-rendered and the component it's re-rendered. So also we can apply that on the, uh, this Svelte thing. So let me see, I just need, did not implement it, uh, filtering here. So let's say try here, filter user, selected filters, it's from our state. Uh, and we, if we add this, it's kind of knows that it's from the, from the store because it has integration in the plugin. And let's, uh, let someone help me. Uh, with, so if user, user includes, includes, no, no, we have two filters, right? So le let's do this together because I did not finish this. So uh, we have selected fil filters with, th with this array. So if user, uh, so if this array includes user, I color, let me just see what's the, the thing for the filter. I color, okay. Okay, if the user includes I color, we should be able to filter this. So let's see green, gray, it's not working, why it's not working? Why it's not working? It's supposed to be reactive, so we need to say, okay, this is actually loaded on the client. And now we might have some errors. Let me see. Maybe the logic, did I put return there? Okay. 
Okay, this is what happens when you have a live coding. So, yep, missing return here. Let's see now. Okay, does someone knows where the bug is? <laughs> okay, maybe maybe we have a different uh, lowercase and uh, two lowercase. Oh, this is very nice. Maybe this was the issue. Okay, so now we have all the thing uh, the users filtered only by the color. Let's fix that in the user table and wrap this up. Uh, so. Basically, here we, ca we can say i color, and then we can add another column, which is i color, just to make sure that our code is working. So now we applied, let me refresh this because I did not implement it. So let's say we want to green. So now it's filtering our users in the Svelte. So this is also Svelte component. This is another Svelte component. This is React component, and this is actually Vue.js component. So each of these filters are actually now applied in our multi-framework uh, front-end application. Okay. We have a conclusion. <laughs> so uh, the conclusion, it's really uh, fast and uh, uh, straightforward. So multi-framework front-ends, since they are tooling, already available, probably they're here and they're on the rise because someone will need these tools and things to upgrade this stuff. Astro, React, Svelte, Vue are just few or many options available which kind of support this, um, this, this uh, approach. Uh, you can also have a, a micro front ends using Vite model federation and then have a different deployment for each your framework and different model, so that's another thing, and everything together set up with the Turbo Repo and Mono Repos. That's a, like kind of one big chunk uh, of hype that's uh, coming up. That's actually already here. So careful planning can lead to successful multi-framework frontends if you need that, and if you have a use case for that, that's actually uh, up to you to decide. And depending of your use case, of course, you need to pick up uh, the right tools for the job uh, so that everyone, the client, the you, uh, that you are learning new things and advancing your skill set, and also the client is satisfied how the app is performant with good UI and uh, nice to use and brings money, right? So that's it. I will take questions now, if any. If not, yeah. Uh, I would like to ask a uh, following questions. So in your demonstrated example, uh, you have serial components written in different frameworks, and then you import all of them into Astra. Yes. But uh, this means that you like uh, decompose page into parts, yep. and you dis decide like this one is written in Vue, this one in Svelte, etc., etc. Uh, can you nest frameworks, for example, create one part cre uh, written in Vue that consists of parts written in React and Svelte, or they should be top-level entities? Uh, I think it should be possible because you can pass the children like props, right? And it will re-render. Uh, I did not try that, I don't know, but every every of each components it can have their own props. So, for example, here you can define children and, yeah. So you can define the uh, children here and pass as a props. So probably you can pass another component, which is JSE component to that, and it will be rendered as the island architect uh, island uh, app. Okay, thanks you. And uh, I'm not more... sure for this. Don't, okay, don't... and one more question, mm -hmm. also related to this one. Uh, so you uh, demonstrated how the global store works here. Uh, because you have a special library for storage that can be imported into different frameworks yep. and can be written and written. But uh, what if one component is nested inside another framework and you want to pass a local state as props? Uh, does it mean that you need to define local state of your component also as atomic storage? 
Yeah, the, uh, probably it will mean by that because I don't know if that appro this approach with the children will fully work and on, uh, what's, what's the limitation of that because I did not try this one. So if you having nesting frameworks, I don't know uh, if the, uh, the, because state it's just a, a JavaScript object. So it should not be a problem just passing the objects, right? But if you want to kind of keep the structure, maybe it would be better to use these atoms as a also local, if you have this kind of multi-framework setup, it would be maybe better to use this uh, tool and define atoms as a plain parts of state that can be passed around, also for the local state. So you can also, as I created here, this global one, selected filters, you can create kind of smaller scoped atoms that are actually for the specific state. Okay, thank you. Probably a last question from me. Mm -hmm. uh, do I correctly understand that you technically can define a local state for components like atoms? So, for example, if you have React app, can you just import atoms and start using them like a state? Yep. Yeah, because they're completely independent. So, you just need to use this because this store it has a lot of uh, options here uh, and it kind of just defined in this way the state on the top level and using an atoms. And the only thing that you will have, it's actually, because this is uh, um, behaving as a regular JavaScript object. So you need to reference that file and import that state if you want to reference that object. So if you have some nested in some component local state and want to use it from the, uh, some view components, which is like higher up in the tree. So maybe it's not best approach to have them inside the component, but actually to rethink the, the structure of uh, atoms and uh, uh, pull it up a bit in the parent. Uh, thank you. That's all from me. Thank you. More? Uh, I have a really quick question regarding Svelte um, and reactivity. So when you're using Svelte, when you want to make some, some function reactive or a component reactive, you put a dollar sign in front of it um, and make it reactive that way uh, when it's inside of the component. So um, it, it, are, is this like when we're, uh, when we're using Astro, are we doing same thing twice? Like, do you have to make something reactive in Svelte and then make it reactive in Astro again? Um, yeah, that, that's a, actually a good question because uh, we are using these uh, parts, these components that are imported here as a uh, islands, right? So uh, each of these island has a, a spe specific um, kind of directive that you can apply that comes from Astro and you need to know which one you should apply. So is it this just HTML or just uh, client visible or just client only or media or idle for, for waiting? So uh, you need to enable these directives in order to make, make the code that you work in, uh, in the, your component, in order to make code in your components work to tell Astro that actually this needs to be passed to the client as a chunk of JavaScript and not as a plain HTML that I had HTML in the island. So that's the only difference. You need to make, if, if you want to make this kind of reactive, you need to implement in the way of the framework it's doing because that's the only way. But on the Astro side, you just say, okay, I, I know that this is reactive and just want to pass this as a, Java, a, ja, uh, as a island actually, as a JavaScript code, because that component is also JavaScript code, but it will re-render on the server. And if you don't say that this is client rendered, it will just be passed as a full component already created, but as a static. Okay, I hope that I managed to explain that more or less. So the thing is, if you're implementing reactivity here, you need to implement the date component work, but without the telling the Astro that it should load that on the client and use the JavaScript, it will not work. Okay, more questions? So, thank you.